Dr. Radhakrishnan Pillai has been on this show multiple times, but we've always only spoken about self-improvement. People know that he's the man behind countless bestsellers. People know that he's one of the premier intellectuals and corporate speakers in this country. What people don't know about Dr. Radha is that he's a consultant for the Indian military, the Indian government, the Indian bureaucracy, and countless Indian politicians. That's how much respect that this man commands in the cream layers of Indian society. Therefore, I thought it's appropriate to do our first current affairs-based podcast with him. 2022 is weather and we show reinvents itself. You're going to see a ton of changes on the show. Everything from the logo to the flavor to the music. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, for more enriching TRS episodes, follow us on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. 2022 has just begun and I promise you, you're going to feel the nature of the podcast changing up completely. This is TRS. Keep supporting. But for now, enjoy Dr. Radha Krishnan Pillai, my mentor, like never before, on the Ranbir Show. Dr. Radhakrishnan Pillai, sir, this is our first recording of 2022. Welcome to the show once again. Happy New Year to each one of you. Happy New Year, sir. Um, this year, my personal content shift is little more talk about current affairs. That's why let's dive straight in, sir. What's been exciting you and what's been sort of deflating you about India lately? India is already in the power game. Unfortunately, we think like followers rather than leaders. So I believe our time has come. We need to get into that space of leading the world in the right way. Hmm. And for me, most important, the spiritual way. Hmm. And what, what has been uh, exciting you? We are a lucky generation. Okay. We don't have to worry about the basics. Roti, kapda, makan, bijli, sadak, pani. Hmm. I'm not saying that we are done yet. That's not our major focus anymore. I think um, we have proved it. Um, so many years, 75 years of struggle. I think next 25 years will be very amazing at the international space. Geopolitics, international relations is going to be very important for our country. Two reasons for this. The people in the country, geographically, who are still Indians, have a major role to play. But secondly, the geopolitics starts with the Indian diaspora as well. The people who have migrated out of India, settled abroad, but still, they have the Indianness in them. Mm. So I think it's going to be a great combination over the next 25 years where the people in India and the Indians out of India will be working together right. to bring back something greater than we have ever seen. Yeah, That's for me. I think we will keep addressing that brain drain problem. But yeah. in truth, the solution to it is what you're saying. That people who want to live there will always live there because that's human choice, human free yes. will. Yes. And the best way to do it is you sit there. You sit in America, you sit in Europe, you work with the locals there, but also do something for your country. And because of this whole COVID situation, work from home has started. Therefore, anyone here can work for anyone. Then you can really build out international businesses. Absolutely. Uh, sir, but uh, I mean, I don't know if the audiences know this. I know this because I speak to you a lot offline as well. You work a lot with our government. You work with the military. Or you're sort of a consultant for both of them. Uh, I know a lot of almost... Confidential stuff, maybe one level less than confidential stuff, which I don't even know if you can reveal online. So, but out of the things you can reveal, what would you like to tell audiences? You know, if there are any specifics you can share about, okay, this is how the military is thinking, this is how the government's thinking. What is the leadership at the top thinking about the country? So, first of all, thank you so much. Offline discussion to online discussions. <laughs> uh, so, I don't think it's confidential, but it is also sensitive. So what I would always say, you know, my friends tell this uh, very often that Radha, your uh, life is an open book. So mm. I don't keep any secrets. Mm. Yet we require maturity to understand the space I am in. I work not only with the government, but various parts of the government. Mm. So let me put it this way. So I'm already part of academia, so Mumbai University. I'm a director over there of the Chanakya International Institute of Leadership Studies. So that's one part of the government. The second, as you rightly mentioned, I do work with the armed forces. Uh, now, when you say armed forces, the first impression people have is about the Jawan who is fighting the Kargil war and, you know, across the China border and the Pakistan border. 
Yeah, that's one space. But there is an intellectual space within the armed forces also. So, you know, I do train at the National Defense College. I do train at the College of uh, Defense Management. And all these are public information. It's not like, you know, but at the same time, what's very important to know that, you know, military is going to play a very important role. Third is bureaucracy. You know, bureaucracy is very important because I believe that the strength of India is actually the bureaucrats. You know, they're highly qualified. They go through an entrance test. They are very well read. They're globally, uh, you know, I would say uh, competitive in their own space. And the fourth, of course, my favorite is politicians. Mm. I do work with a lot of politicians, help them out with plans. You know, mm. That's very important. All this because of Chanakya. Mm. Because Chanakya was guiding the government and he were guiding the Rajas. So I've been very fortunate that uh, all these things are there in my part of life also, where I'm working with all these segments, academia, military, bureaucracy, politicians, etc. Coming back to what I would like to say, especially since our audience is youth, please get interested in political science, mm. public policy, international relationship, geopolitics. The time has come for India not to worry about what's going to be my career. Now it's going to be whether you're contributing to India at the global level. Mm. It's a very important space. And unfortunately, previous uh, thought process was uh, all these issues, public policy, international, it was limited to some diplomats and ambassadors out over there. But with the internet boom and the digital space that we are in, I think everybody is a soldier out over there. So we have cyber soldiers out over here. We have soldiers who may not be only across the border, but who are fighting cyber crimes right from, you know, internet hacking. Mm. So I would say that my request to all of you is that please get interested in the policy level making. You don't have to be a policy maker, but there are so many courses out over there. So coming back, any questions you want to answer specifically, I'll be there. But my request is that today the Raja Vidya, the knowledge for the kings is open to everyone. It has become Praja Vidya. Mm. So don't think that, you know, there's a barrier out over there. Oh, he's top and I'm the common man. The power of the common man is actually the power of the king. Mm. And because that's of, what... Because of the internet. Absolutely. So mm. become a king even if you're a common man. Mm. I have so many tangential questions, sir. Uh, let's start with the four wings that you named, you know, bureaucracy, education, politicians and the government in general. Yes. Uh, why don't you break all four down? If you can give an example, nothing like it, you sure. know. Uh, but in what way do they consult you and uh, how do leaders there think? Because I'm assuming that, see, if you are, say, the chief of military, you have to think of, okay, how do we protect India against China now? Yeah. Because that's the looming threat everyone sure. knows about. Sure. Um, I would also like to know what is the top layer of the bureaucracy thinking? What is the top layer of academia thinking? What is the top layer of the government in general thinking? What's happening there? Uh, I think that's a nice question. I like to break them into four parts, as you rightly pointed out. The first part is academia. Now, I'm not only talking about the university academia. So academia is actually the intellectual part of our community. Okay, they do the policy making, they do think tanks and being part of the Mumbai University, I've been very fortunate that, you know, I was instrumental in conducting the first International Yoga Day in US. Mm. So we had an international conference. So I have a perspective what happens today at the power level in the academia. So if you look at it today, we have a, a concept called a soft power. So hard power is where the military comes in, the strategy part of it comes in, but we are moving into soft power. Yoga, India's soft power, Bollywood being a soft power, and various other things. Cultural Ayur exports. Exactly. Even Ayurveda is a soft power. Mm. But we are moving from uh, soft power to what is called as the smart power. So in the academia, what generally happens is that we make policies, structure, schemes for the government. Let me give you a simple example. What, what does policy even mean? Like when you say, okay, you're making policies, what does it actually mean? Okay. So a policy from a corporate angle is about you know, how do you turn around your company probably in the pandemic era. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about public policy. So governments sit down and make plans which are important for the society. For example, we are in Mumbai. Okay, now what is the very important part of Mumbai right now? So the state government or the municipal corporation of Mumbai will sit down and say, okay, we need to have metros. And you can see all over the metros happening. Now that's a policy that has been set by the government after a lot of brainstorming. Now, how does a policy get formed? And I would suggest all of you to even think about doing a small course on public policy. It's very much available and, you know, a short course on internet. So many edutech companies are offering. Uh, so a public policy is a plan which is generally made by the top guys. 
sitting over there, the bureaucrats, but they don't make it alone. They invite ideas from the public and you can participate in public policy. So in the academia side, you know, I've been involved in so many committees where we sit down and, you know, think about it. Like I'll give a simple example. There was this particular idea that, you know, we should introduce leadership as a subject in our country. Mm. Uh, you rightly pointed out um, that, you know, uh, brain drain. What happened in the brain drain era is the best of the minds from India went abroad. And I would say, in a way, it was good in the long term, if you look at it, because uh, the guys who left India are still contributing to India. So if you look at the tweeters and the IBMs and the Microsoft and the Googles, all of them studied here. Mm. But there was this thought process that came in our university and saying that, you know, are we going to take it to the next level? What does our generation require? So it's okay, let us move from management to leadership, which is one step above. So we formulated the first ever institution in Mumbai University called the Chanakya International Institute of Leadership Studies. So we actually do a two years master's program on leadership. We mm -hmm. offer PhD in leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, how did this happen? So it was an idea, of course, with the vice chancellor and all the academia came together, brainstorm on it. There's a process to it. It is not an idea. Please understand, idea to a plan is business. Mm -hmm. Idea to a business plan is what we generally talk in the corporate world, in a startup world. But we are talking about a public policy where an idea has to go through a process where in the academia we go through what is called as the board of studies, BOS. Typically, when you have to introduce a syllabus, you can't do it alone. Okay, so there is a group of five to seven people who come down, brainstorm what are the subjects to be taught. Then it has to be approved by a higher authority called as the academic council. Again, it has to be approved by something called as a management council. Then it's everybody approved by the uh, chancellor. So you have to look at the process. But after that hard work is done, then it becomes a part of the bigger game. Mm. So coming, I just give an example of how a public policy becomes a kind of a system in the academia, which I spoke about leadership. Now let me shift it to bureaucracy. In bureaucracy, the typical word means those people who run the government machinery. So the easiest word to associate with bureaucracy is a civil servants mm. or civil services. And there are many of them, you know. Uh, highest is IFS, Indian Foreign Service, IPS, uh, Indian Police Service. We had Shivanandan sir on the podcast. Then we have IAS, Indian Administrative Service, Indian Forest Service. So there are many of them. Now what generally happens is that um, the government is run through a machinery. Mm. Okay, So there are people who run the whole show. So if you look at today we are sitting again in Mumbai, the Municipal Corporation. Now, there is some machinery which runs it. So, let's say the commissioner of Mumbai Municipal Corporation. Now, he is a trained bureaucrat. He knows the whole systems, the processes, studied the rules. So, in India, how do you become a bureaucrat? The first question. And the second is, what does a bureaucrat do? So, uh, today, uh, there are open competitive exams. So, if you want to become a collector or this general, you know, dreams people have in the tier two cities. Uh, I would say even villages, you know, the biggest thing is to become a collector because that was a system started by the Britishers. So the government will select a few group of people through a competitive exam process. So there are so many exams that's happening, you crack them. And then you're trained in the government administrative system. So let's say you go through a two years of rigorous training and things like that. And after that, uh, you would be put into certain, uh, you know, states. For example, IAS officer or an IPS officer. So Indian Administrative Service or Indian Police Service, after the two years training program is over, they would generally choose which state they want to work in. So Shivanandan sir giving the example was actually from Tamil Nadu. Okay, born, brought up over there. But later on, uh, he cracked the exam and after his IPS uh, training, he was asked, you know, which state would you like to serve? So of course, he chose Maharashtra. Mm. He comes to Maharashtra and then the whole 30 years that he worked in various postings in Maharashtra. Of course, from time to time, they go to deputations outside the state and maybe outside uh, the country also. Mm. So the bureaucracy generally functions to understand how the state is run. So if you look at civics and politics as a subject, they're the execution body. Mm. Okay. So, so today look at everything that's getting executed, there will be a bureaucrat, both at the state and the central level. So that's the whole machinery that works. And believe me, uh, it's a system with a lot of power. Okay, so a collector sometimes also is also a district magistrate. He can take, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can take legal decisions. So that's a power that you get. Mm. Uh, coming back to what is the role of a bureaucrat? The role of a bureaucrat is to execute the kind of a decisions that are taken at the state level, which the politicians generally do, you know. So they will have an idea, from mm. a bill it becomes an act. 
uh, I want to simplify it. Let's say, okay, again, uh, the government decides, like we have to have, you know, national highways. And that's what Nitin Gadkari ji is currently doing as a head of all the highways at Noura. Now, who executes it? The politicians are representatives of people in democracy. So they get selected, they'll debate and discuss in the parliament and afterwards they say, okay, done. Mm. But karega mm. kaun? So these bureaucrats come into it and they're very intellectual. They have budgets with them. They have the plans with them. They have a complete missionary with them. They have power with them. And believe me, if you have a good bureaucrat, he can turn around a whole city or a village for that particular matter. So coming back, I do work with the bureaucrats in giving some inputs. And I've been fortunate that many bureaucrats do call me and say that oh, we have a small project. So rather, sir, can you handle it? So I'll give you one simple example. Uh, when the government decided that, you know, we need to take International Yoga Day really big. Okay, now that's a statement. Okay, but how do you do it? So I remember 2016, one of the ministers right over Delhi, Rajya Sabha minister, uh, he just called me up and said, you know, uh, we know you can do it because you're already part of academia. Mm. So, okay, can you handle this particular program? I said, okay, so what's the program? I have no idea. I don't worry, you'll get a call. So I got a call from an IAS officer. Okay, very sweet person and saying that, you know, rather, sir, you know, we have this particular project by the government. We have the funds, we have the budgets, but we need to actually do uh, yoga in a very big way. So let's start with India and we'll take it global. I said, okay, so I don't understand it. Well, okay, but... They said, you know, Radha, sir, we understand what you can deliver. I said, okay, let's have a meeting. So I flew to Chandigarh at that particular time. Uh, and with my uh, PhD guy, Dr. Shubhada Joshi, and so we went over there and said, listen, here is a project by the government of India that we need to make uh, International Yoga Day really big. Uh, thanks to our prime minister, you know, it was already uh, cleared at the international level where United Nations accepted uh, International Yoga Day as a formal day to be celebrated globally. But that's not enough. Mm. What do you do? So 2016, Chandigarh was the place from where we actually launched the International Yoga Day. So I had the power, a temporary power to actually hold the whole conference. So I took around 60 people from Mumbai University and of course Chandigarh. We hosted, we had three day major international conference where we had Baba Ramdev and all the yoga gurus coming over there. I was uh, instrumental in designing the program. When I say I, I mean with the whole team mm -hmm. of the government machinery, and it was amazing. And I can tell you a small uh, instant of uh, my first, uh, I would say, uh, rubbing with power. So since I was in charge, you know, I had two, three IAS officers over there. And I could see that one person was a vendor. He was actually misusing the public funds. Okay. So uh, he was supposed to make some videos and things like that. Because we wanted to use it in a digital format and all. And I could sense that, you know, he's not delivering. He's trying to take money from the government. Okay. And now, remember, I'm a semi-bureaucrat. Mm. So I can't let my public funds go. And I remember I telling one of these IAS officers saying that, you know, I think this guy is something fishy. So now I'm on the side of the government. I'm not on the uh, public side. And you'd be surprised. Okay. Next day, he just came and told me and saying that he's been arrested. <laughs> I said, what? Well, you are in charge of the conference. We just checked it and it was true. So he was misusing the power. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, wait. I just told that, you know, he's doing something fishy. Said, yeah, you have the power. Your word is last. I said, okay, thank you. Yeah. I just settled down. And I told my team also, you know, saying that, listen, this is temporary. So a statement in the government is not a statement. Your wish is my command. So think about which level. Uh, execution at the bureaucratic level can do. Of course, the good news is that, you know, don't worry about it. He came out of it and all those things, the money was recovered. But that is the first time I realized what the government can do. Unfortunately, our first impression of the government is corruption. But there are so many people who are uncorrupt, working for the public funds as well. And they're doing it in the right way. So that's bureaucracy on the other side where execution is like done. So three days of international conference and, you know, we had the best of best. And, you know, thanks to, uh, of course, I got some award from the governor and all those things. Second important thing, because it was delivered very well. Okay, because let me tell you something, my dear friends. Government also want good people to work with them. Mm. Who doesn't want good people, right? So I forgot and I said, okay, move on. But immediately after I got a call again from the same minister in the parliament and saying that now let's do it international. I said, what do you mean by international? Okay, India ho gaya, ab New York mein karte. And you'd be surprised. Again, I was given the power. Remember this, power is for service. Power should not be used for your benefit. So, 
So International Yoga Day, we did in New York uh, a year after that, and it was such a successful conference that I took around 60 people from India. Again, government budgets, public funds. Believe me, it was one of the most successful academic conference happening right there in New York. We are hosted by the Consulate General. You know, I can still feel the power right now because when we landed up in New York, okay, think about this, friends. The actual people, the government representatives, the diplomats in U.S. representing our country, came and received us inside the plane. Mm. Now, what does it mean? Don't think that it's about me. We are representing a government, and half of our academicians who went over there had what we call it as official passport. What is an official passport? Most of the Indians will have what we call it as a, a blue passport. But the blue passport is like a normal citizen, but there are different levels of passport also. So many of us actually carried what is called a white, white passport. So you are representing the government of India. Okay. And of course, you have to be very careful about it because uh, you should never misuse the power. At the same time, you are also representing a culture, a civilization, a country. We did it, we came back, and of course the passport is taken away, okay? That's temporary. Wow. So what generally happens is that we're representing a country, whether it's a diplomat or an ambassador, or uh, if, even if you are on a certain government assignments, the government gives you the power to handle those responsibilities. And once, remember this, once the responsibilities are over, you need to surrender your power also. Mm. So one thing I learned uh, being in the government is that, you know, you will get the certain power, but remember, you're in a mission mode. The day the mission is over, you should be a common man again. Mm. The third part is, of course, armed forces, the military part of it. It's a huge machinery. I'm still learning. But I do teach Kautilya Arthashastra uh, to the, the leadership team in the armed forces. I'm still a student, but I'm teaching them. What does that entail? So, Arthashastra of Kautilya, okay, which my area of specialization is Chanakya's wisdom, talks about a lot of military strategies. And it's the geopolitical ideas like Mandala theory, Samadana Dandabheda. So unfortunately, we Indians have to awaken to our own knowledge. So I'm being a small role in playing that, awakening the armed forces and saying, listen, this is our knowledge, you know, why don't you apply it? So that's happening. Yeah, I've heard that Chanakya's teachings are so kind of renowned all over the world that other countries also use it in their military training. Yes. Uh, and But the Indian military also does. Yes. yes. Has, has it always used it? Uh, so I would say that India always used it, but pre post british era you know it's more about what's happening in the western world i'm not saying that we should not be aware of what's happening abroad i mean we need to get the best of the weapons the missiles everything is fine yet you know that's a very famous statement the man behind the machine is more important than the machine hmm. so at the strategy level at the thinking level are you having an indian strategies so fortunately, we have a lot of wisdom in our own ancient Indian script about how to handle war and conflicts. Hmm. So, you know, I'm teaching that. Wow. And uh, what about the fourth one, which is politicians? I, I love them. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the assumption of a lot of listeners yeah. here now is, oh, so Radhas has worked with corrupt people. <laughs> like that's the, that's the first inclination. But what, what's it actually like working with politicians? Yes, yes. So fortunately, um, not a single politician uh, that I have come across has made me part of their corruption. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the respect that I get from my politicians is amazing. So, you know, be it member of parliament or I had an opportunity of even meeting prime minister himself. I've, I've been very fortunate that, you know, there's a lot of respect that I have gained because of Chanakya in the space of politicians also. So let me tell you first things first. You know, let's get it right that politicians are representative of people. We elect them, we select them, we send them over there. Now, coming back to the corruption part of it, uh, let us be very clear on this particular part. In every particular um, field, okay, there are good people and bad people. Good doctors, bad doctors, good lawyers, bad lawyers, uh, good teachers, bad teachers. Tell me a field where you don't have both sides of the coin. Coming back to politicians, I tell you that you know there are very, very good politicians also. I've seen member of parliaments who walked out of the parliament after the term was over. And believe me, they didn't have five rupees in their particular pockets. I've seen them, they hosted me. Yet, the power is that they could announce and five lakh people can gather together. Mm. They did not have So I've seen this, you know. So I've seen there is this kind of a politician. Now, if you go to Delhi, and I suggest all the youth to please go to Delhi, just walk around Delhi and seeing that, you know, they are representative of us. So we have, let's say, an MP, member of parliament coming from maybe South Mumbai, <laughs> which is one of the richest parts of the country. And we have an MP coming from a small state. And I know when I take my students to Delhi on a parliament visit and we, we take a lot of my students from Mumbai University over there. 
यू वुड बी सरप्राइज दिस पोलिटिशियंस इन्वाइट अस्ट सिंह हमारे घर पर आओ अफकोर्स द प्रॉपर्टीज द गवर्नमेंट वेन दे आर द रिप्रेजेंटेटिव सो आई स्टिल रिमेंबर दिस डे वेन वी एड विजिटेड फोर एम पीज इन देर हाउसेज फोर एम पीज ओके फोर डिफरेंट स्टेट्स फोर डिफरेंट प्लेसेज दे केम फ्रॉम सो एट द फर्स्ट प्लेस दैट वी वेंट इट वॉज लाइक वेरी नॉर्मल सबको चाय नाश्ता हो रहा है द सेकेंड प्लेस वी वेंट यू नो बिलीव मी दैट पोलिटिशियन वॉज सो पुअर दैट लिटरली समोसा के लिए भी उसको स्पॉन्सर ढूंढना पड़ा द थर्ड पोलिटिशियन ऑफकोर्स वॉज फॉर आर लोकल पोलिटिशियन चलो सबको गिफ्ट दे रहे हैं ऑल दोज थिंग्स But the fourth politician who hosted us for dinner was like a royal person, you know. It was like wow. It was not five star. It was seven star. So when I come back and saying that you know it's a mix of politicians, we can't brand them as one type because everybody comes from different parts of our country. Everybody comes from different economic standards. But I can tell you one thing: all politicians, all politicians work very, very, very hard. Mm. It's a public life, twenty-four by seven. Mm. Believe me. It's I, very hard. I think Nitin Gadkari had this one video where he said that find me one politician who is happy, and I'll give you whatever you want. Is that true? Uh, again, happiness for me is an internal journey, so you can never be happy <laughs> if you look at external public appreciation because uh, politicians have come to the fact that it's a thankless job. Mm. Okay, but let me also tell you, Chandra spoke about Raja Rishi. Raja is politician, he is in power, but he has to be Rishi. So yes, I appreciate Nitin Gadkari ji because you know public don't appreciate. It's always like looking at the darker side. They forget the kind of a commitment that they have. They work very hard, and believe me, I have a lot of respect for politicians. Mm. I think you have the right to say that because you work to them, Manohar. Yes. That's the next question, actually. What work do you do with politicians specifically? Yeah. Like I got the other three, but with them, is it like for their campaigns, for their agenda? Like what? Why do they consult with you? Yeah, that, that's a very important question. Remember one thing: politicians don't have time to think. Oh, okay. So there's so much activity. I mean, when we, you know, when you do so many videos again and again, there's a time that you require for a break to think on and strategize. Imagine a person, a politician. So I can tell you, you know, people seven o'clock in the morning, the people are inside their house, hmm. and they're gone till two or three in the night. Now tell me one thing: such a public life, and you're meeting a corporate leader to a person who is a woman activist to somebody who is. so you meet every type of people you know a politician's life is very hard so what unfortunately happens with politicians they don't have time to sit down think analyze and that's where actually the bureaucrats come in so you know they are the one who will think and make a plan i'd actually like to ask you again about these four, four departments yeah. so what are the four departments thinking of about the 2020s like what should people know okay so 2020 let's take academy again very mm. part important part of the society it definitely gone into a hybrid model okay okay so education academia it's initially it was physical now it's digital be it school level or college or university level i think with the uh, things happening so it's a double kind mm -hmm. of a thing happening yeah and epidemiologists are saying that covid situations are going to happen every year over the next every 10 year. years some sort of covid situation absolutely so we're getting prepared and let me tell you if uh, doctors i respect them a lot saved human beings teachers Saved a generation. Okay. Anyway, moving on to the next part, sir. What about bureaucracy? What are they thinking? So bureaucracy has moved in very fast. So let me tell you this: they are also doing online meetings. So if a bureaucrat had to call a meeting, believe me, it was a physical meeting. Everybody would come and make. Ah, okay, digital. Karo. They can have five meetings today. So the speed of execution. Yes, you are absolutely right. So let me give an indication. One of the important parts of bureaucracy is also to collect tax, the revenue departments. you just look at it the kind of a speed that we have in tax collection today tds and this and that very fortunately for india we adapted to the digital economy very fast and all bureaucrats are very efficient they have their own challenges no doubt about it but you know because we were adapted to the digital economy or the digital way of working before the covid believe me we are having the largest tax collection we are spending also so i would say that bureaucracy also has adapted to the speed and the policy making is happening yet not to the level that we were previously but we are doing good um what are they thinking but because i from what i have made of what you've said bu bureaucrats basically build the country yes they are like you can say national level laborers for yes. building up india yes so are they thinking of newer cities are they thinking of newer projects like what's happening yeah so there are two levels bureaucrats generally work with one is at the policy level which i told you they'll make the plans but the second one the execution level 
initially the execution level was happening within the government so people used to work in psus you know they used to be employed with the government but that's not been a model that has been super successful so today bureaucrats are outsourcing things to like companies companies individual startups so like, let, like for example, let, let me give an example okay so let's say the government let's say the police department okay wants to create a video on you know traffic awareness or cyber awareness initially the one person in the police department would make it but today is not no so i would maybe call ranveer and say you know why don't you partner with us maybe your team does it and they'll pay you for that mm. believe me uh, you'd be surprised bureaucrats also officially pay consultants so if you are going to a company and let's say you are getting a deal you can also get it from the government because mm. government wants to be efficient and it's good to have somebody who is efficient outsource rather than somebody within the uh, government who is overburdened believe me bureaucrats are overburdened so much to do so one of the things that the bureaucrats are doing is outsourcing their work to efficient people mm. try that it's called b2g model business from government yeah. what i understood from what you even said about politicians is that even they outsource to teams but the teams also outsource to private sector absolutely so uh, basically in the private sector there's a lot of opportunity to work with the government if you actually go out looking for it. you should in fact i would say uh, please study on what is called the ppp model public private partnership Okay, please do a lot of reading. Governments always gives out projects openly. You can bid for them, and if you're very good, you'll get invited. Let me tell you, one is the bidding process where you can see all the newspapers. They have this, you know, ads coming up and saying that contracts. Why don't you apply for it? That is a bidding process. In fact, the huge budgets of the government cannot be spent only by the government, right? You need efficient guys to come and execute. So, social media is a big space. Let me tell you. and there's funds for it and they will give you i have got money from the government for conducting all these things officially legally with tax mm. being paid from my side so i would suggest that you know work with the government respect the government you will legally make money from the government also uh military sir military is going through a very interesting phase of change okay not only in india globally so initially military was what we see in movies you know it's like hard military across the borders land water air force so that's hard yes definitely but military now has gone to three levels one is called uh, the 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 hard power of the military that you see with guns and missiles the second is called cyber wars mm. again okay, the third is called space wars you know our military is getting equipped to that level so from the hard which is very important at the basic level we are going to cyber so we do see a lot of cyber wars already happening there are cyber warriors now okay so military is getting at and of course let's not forget space wars are also there i remember when we were kids we used to watch this called uh, you know star trek mm. and all these avengers movies that you speak about so i'm not talking about the aliens level but definitely uh, the geopolitics is coming to the level where you know space is going to be very major in military strategy so i am not an expert in cyber neither in uh, uh, i would say a space part of it i definitely contribute from the strategic part of it so mm. you know what do you do but so e- even in the cyber and space part you'll contribute uh, so strategic. that's not my space okay because i am not a cyber expert but okay. it's like you know if you have a cyber warrior you have to still tell him what to do mm. please understand this that's my space yeah we actually had a cyber security expert saket modi on the yes. show uh, and i urge listeners to check out that podcast because it's very relevant to everybody yeah. all of our cyber security uh, can be compromised yes. and it's very important to be educated about that it's actually a modern day skill set which a lot of people don't pay attention to i'd also like to highlight the ranveer show clips it's highlights of all these podcasts like quick highlights it's a new youtube channel we started so we're regularly uploading two podcasts a week the highlights are on there at least check out the highlights of that episode but coming back to this conversation sir um you know so i've had understanding about the cyber security aspect from saket movi and what you're saying is exactly how it is that even countries like china countries like maybe russia you know all these countries which are perceived as hmm are they threats to india what's happening there mm-hmm. uh, those countries also breeding like armies of hackers yes and so is india yes um so there's a lot happening in that space and this is almost becoming a new wing of the indian military yes uh, like air force navy army and now cyber yes uh can you imagine a 16 year old kid going for a hackathon enjoys coding learns bits of hacking and he gets recruited by the indian military that's i'm pretty sure that's happening already it's already happening and mm. we are ready for it mm. but in, when it comes to space what's the logic is it like you want to basically 
dominate physical areas in space using satellites or something like uh, so again i'm not an expert i will not be able to comment on it but i'll tell you what space is all about from my understanding limited understanding today all your communications are uh, not just cyber it's space so you know the kind of communication that you get satellites so today as a policy of the government okay i'm talking about general policy i'm not only talking about military policy so we are sending a lot of uh, satellites isro a lot of other drdo they're working a lot on that so today there is a game happening i'm not telling that it's a, a space war hmm. but the number of satellites that you have out over there that determines power absolutely hmm. and we are fortunate that you know when um, previously when our first astronaut went to space uh, uh, captain rakesh sharma if you remember that era uh, and india actually got asian games hosted in our particular country first time that was a change of power for us because we're very very young at that global level but today with space being on our side and believe me believe me we don't uh, uh, even know the kind of a power that and the respect that we command at the global level of course we have nuclear power with us we have cyber power with her the it generation is with us but let's not forget we also have space power with us but so okay with with the military what else are they thinking i know for a fact that they're very conscious of this whole china issue every single member of the indian military is very aware of geopolitics in a in a much deeper way than uh, the geopolitical experts we see on news channels also yeah, yeah, yeah. um but what is the actual indian military thinking about especially yeah. the whole china issue okay so let me put the what is the role of military any military across the world okay it's not just india or you know any other country in the world military has got two primary roles okay one is across the border okay and of course inside the border mm. so what does a military generally do you know in one way we are fortunate you know we have not seen too much wars in our generation think about 1947 okay torn country into two parts india pakistan bangladesh you know there was no food to eat half of your military was into you know fighting and this and all those things fortunate in the last few years of course we have some uh, border conflicts with pakistan and china all this is happening but the major strength of the military is preparation for the unknown mm. so they are ready and we are always there yet if you look at what are they doing otherwise one is preparation for the unknown that can come any time but they are amazing people they are highly educated people they also work on various other peace time operations so when a flood happens okay okay the first thing is that you know the government machinery the bureaucrats will get you disaster management but a time comes they have to give a call to an army and there comes a thak 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 So believe me, our Indian Army is not just working across the border; they are working inside the border. And let me also tell you, since I work with the military a lot, there is a lot of social awareness that they do. So let me give an example. I was at uh, uh, a very interesting place in Gujarat called as INS Valsura, Indian Naval Ship Valsura. So the commanding officer is a great friend of mine. In that particular few days that I stayed over there, I was so touched by the human side of the Indian Army or the Indian Armed Forces. You know what they did? All the uh, women. The, of the naval forces officers they took out a car rally they went to villages okay they gave them televisions they said okay, please come and take admission in our schools if you want we can help you they contributed financially and they were actually telling the girls out over there please come and join the indian armed forces so don't think that army just sitting over there ki waiting for an instruction ki abhi kabhi war hoga believe me they are very good human beings they work with the society and I'll tell you the kind of uh, work that are done in COVID. We don't even realize that, and it is not only for the military people. They go out over there, talk to people, help them out. The good part about the army is that you know they're very detached people with a lot of sense of service to the country. What do you mean by detachment? Every army officer knows that you know death is around the corner any time. Mm. So they live the best of the life, and the only purpose of their life is service for the country. and if you give them social service also they do amazingly the kind of a schools that they run the kind of a projects that are unfortunately we don't even know about them i would suggest that you get some army officers i i'm not even talking about what's happening against china and pakistan that's that's one part of it you know that's comes out in the media but each of them is a human being who works for the society mm. now, coming back to the second part of your question what's happening i think good news for indian military we are not mm. small we are the second largest armed forces in the world that's not small so from a country which was you know roti kapda makan to now we are taken very seriously are we there the answer is yes have we got it there big issue not yet mm. so that's where uh, you know probably we have to think and i am doing a lot of deliberation what is big issue somebody who's at the world level that's where geopolitics comes so army navy air force 
they are all working on geopolitical angles also now and we had major general gd bakshi on the show the insight i got from him is that uh, over the last 10 years or so the indian military has changed into kind of developing their own weapons and yeah. really powerful weapons so there are great indian engineering minds also working with the yeah, military true. and he was urging um, you know basically uh, indian youth who are capable of uh, engineering and helping with building this infrastructure for the army he was encouraging people to join hands with the indian armed forces because that's actually what the country needs right now you are absolutely right the make in india hmm. a lot of uh, you know internal uh, weapons are getting created ships are getting created you know the mass gone dog so i think it's a great moment for our country especially for the youth please partner with our government project especially the military they are wanting good minds to come my request is please join the armed forces Mm. you know it is one space that we should uh, i'm not telling you be a permanent army officer there are short service commissions you know maybe 2 years 5 years but get trained and contribute they are part of our nation and we should take pride in the military mm. uh so in the final one politicians what are politicians in the country thinking because honestly the way it's looking uh, on a national level we know that the bjp is going to be in power for a very mm-hmm. long time now uh, be- primarily because there's no competition yes. uh, like that's the main mm-hmm. reason but what's your take on this whole situation india is in a golden era okay and okay san apna time aayega nahi apna time aa chuka hai next 4 years is very very important for us 3 to 4 years economically bit, everywhere bit economy bit military everything put together okay a bit even business for that particular matter why i tell this is that if you follow me on twitter and media server you will see always see something like india hashtag #india2025 i don't know if you have noted that we will ask what is india2025 so i'll give us a little bit of a spiritual dimension to it uh, swami vivekananda he is a youth icon by the way uh, 12th of january it's coming soon 12th of january is national youth day the birthday of swami vivekananda he said in the year 2025 india will become the global power we are there coming back what are the politicians thinking fortunately our politicians are thinking in the right direction we are there out over there i know so many politicians in fact i had a meeting with an mp very interesting so they had gone for this you know many of the conferences that happen abroad and india is their representative believe me believe me indian politicians are taken very seriously at the geopolitical level so yeah. it is no more another country you know now they say and i seen this that india is taken seriously so that action ki aap baithiye i want to listen to your view mm. and we are no more a market we are the people who have the power to say something and we'll be heard initially it was okay maybe 180 countries one more country now we are among the top 10 but let me tell you we are now among the top 3 to be taken seriously no international policies can be made without the input of india today and that's the power so next 3 years what we do the politicians are super careful because when we go out over there and invite people to invest in india look at the numbers they are coming and we need to capitalize on this in fact i have a request to everyone let indians take the global opportunity that is right in front of us mm. made in business made in economics i don't know whatever we are space we have arrived and the politicians are the face of it they are doing their work very well okay uh, so we have to move into the twitter verse round yeah. uh, i think the audience got a nice flavor of what this year is going to be all about wow so this is sort of a rapid fire uh, mm-hmm. round this uh, this is like questions sent from twitter mm-hmm. you're one of our trs all stars sir uh, wow. i think after this episode especially people are going to ask you a different sort of uh genre of questions because really, people there were things you said here which i didn't even know about you which i didn't know about you despite knowing you for like i think 3 4 years now but anyway the first question is from manish pande uh, would like rather sir to touch upon the new economic status india has and where is it going to go hmm. so actually so do you have like some sort of insight on how the world is looking at india and what's actually happening with the economy hmm. and i and i ask you this again because you work with economists you work with the government and i again feel news channels will direct uh, the narrative according to their own agenda so what's the neutral perspective what's happening so at the economic angle let me tell you a very great person everybody should follow his name is ashish chauhan okay he heads bsc bombay stock exchange now what else can we talk about the indian economy from a perspective of the stock market because that's your first sign to the world that we have arrived in the last 2 uh, years it's just gone up so i would say that there is a lot of confidence level within the country uh, i can tell you stock market is only one of the indicators but a major indicator 
I can tell you other side of it. And I mentioned this in my um, uh, discussion also. Our tax collections have gone up. Your generation, okay, when you start up a company, it is not about avoiding taxes anymore. Mm. It's planning your taxes. Mm. So one of the biggest things that we can see, especially that has happened is GST. So there was a lot of resistance and, you know, Modi ji made sure it happened and all those things. All the bad, bad, it is gone. It's very simple, right? And it's your mind is more focused on building your business rather than worrying about tax evasions now. So do your tax planning, no doubt about it. Our government coffers are getting better and better. At the international level, you know, we we, we have arrived. Now coming back, Indian economy is doing decent. That doesn't mean all your economic problems are solved. Coming back to the uh, question that Manish has, you know, what's going to happen? We are already the world's fastest growing economy globally. Globally. I read, you know, Oh, Mint and Economic Times and Financial Express every single day. Because Chanakya was very clear, a country without economic power is not powerful at all. So when we when we talk about international economics, it's basically how much money are you earning versus how much money... So there earning? are a lot of parameters to that. So like the import, export, and then, you know, uh, inflation. Mm. It also depends upon your um, um, savings. Uh, then, of course, very important parameters also your uh, currency rates. So, you know, $1 against uh, whatever, 78, how can you do that? So, so a lot of factors matter internationally because it's not just about one parameter. So, uh, at the global economic level, India definitely is growing, but we still not arrived yet. So, I didn't say, you know, most of our economies, especially RBI, State Bank of India and all these major banks, they are also reconciling because of the digital era that's happening. So, a lot of different uh, units of experts work together yes, they to do. drive the economy yes, upwards. Absolutely. And when we say drive the economy upwards, it basically boils down to how much money the country is making and like as in like how much we are growing, absolutely. how many jobs we are creating. Absolutely. And the last point which I love to say is, you know, let us not look at uh, a global economics only from a country's perspective. Today, we are an interdependent economy globally. So when I'm using an Apple phone, okay, a part of my money goes to America also. A part of my uh, thing goes to maybe another country where it's manufactured and a part of it goes to my country. So it's a very uh, complex process where I cannot just be myself, yet I should not forget myself. Mm. So it's actually an interdependent world. So a goods manufactured in one place may have an R&D department in another place, sold in another place and post sales service can be in another country. So we have to look into various factors, but not forget India. Mm, okay. Uh, so next question is, um, okay, Ayush Bajaya asks an interesting question because 2022, the flavor is current affairs. Hopefully we find the right guess. Yes. Uh, what is the best platform to study about current affairs in an unbiased way? Okay. So the best way to study current economics is read three different newspapers. <laughs> Okay, that's very, very important. And somewhere I still believe because I come from that generation where physical newspapers still matters. So today we have a lot of uh, digital stuff coming. And unfortunately, one thing about digital information is again, algorithms play a mm. major role. Okay, it's because suppose I want to Google something and saying that, you know, I know those feeds are going to keep coming. I don't want them. I just, let's say, I want to have an information about ex-politician. Now that every time he goes somewhere, it just keeps coming. That's not interest for me. So... For me, I read three to four newspapers every single day. Wow, that, that's the first time someone has said that. And that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming at the audience as a social media entrepreneur. This is so accurate that your algorithms will manipulate exactly what you see. Therefore, it's important to stick to the analog world in this case, because this is your funnel for whatever is happening in the outside world. Absolutely. All the information that's happening, you need to know the 360 degree perspective rather than the perspective that just kind of elevates your own views or your own hatred or your own love. Absolutely. So let me put it this way. Why do I read, you know, five newspapers a day? To keep your head neutral. Absolutely. Mm. And you know, the thing is that I read stuff which is not my choice also. Mm. For example, let's say Free Plus Journal or Times of India or Economic Times or Mint. No, there are four or five papers and I read a Malayalam newspaper also every day, by the way. To just get perspective. Absolutely. And it's so rich. The half an hour to 45 minutes I read every day makes me know what's happening in the real world or at least the reported world. It's not just what I want to know or what the, you know, the Google is wanting me to know. Wow. In an era of personalization, some things shouldn't be personal. It should not be. And I can tell you this, you know, if you look at any newspaper and there is one, maybe a section on global news. I'll tell you, you get so much rich perspective about maybe China or Pakistan or Israel or Russia, which mm. will not be there when I Google it. 
Mm. So they may hide or maybe want to input something which they want. So my suggestion is that you know for neutrality, go into physical world as much as possible, but don't forget the digital world. Mm. Wow, and read a variety of news. Variety, variety, because again there are newspapers which are you know run by certain politicians. <laughs> Then you will mm. get their agenda. Mm. That's why multiple perspectives is important. Mm. Okay, uh, Arihant Jain asks: Is the idea of Akhand Bharat an impossible goal? Will it really happen? I don't think it's an impossible goal. So what is this idea of Akhand Bharat? Okay. Uh, so first of all, let's understand this word called Akhand Bharat. And typically what historians speak about or what's happening in Indian civilization discussions. So Akhand means undivided. A khand without division. Bharat is of course a great country. Uh, you know, geographically speaking, India is not the country that we see about from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and all that. So we were having a land right up to Afghanistan and maybe a little bit ahead also on this side. You know, Bangladesh, the modern, all part of. So when India was um, under probably that kind of a space of Akhanda Bharat, we had Pakistan as a part of our country, Bangladesh, and then Afghanistan for that matter. And you know, one of the interesting parts is that um, borders keep changing every generation. <laughs> Okay, so it's not only our generation. Every country across the globe, you know, Russia was there. Soviet Union split. So this borders as a concept will keep evolving and changing. So mm -hmm. China is trying to let's say take over this part and that part. So they want to make maybe a global China over a period of twenty years. You know, mm -hmm. so they have some spots across the globe. So my concept of Akhanda Bharat is not just geographical or physical land, but it's also cultural. So I can actually have an Indian with a U.S. passport. I can have an Indian. Who are actually staying in Japan? Mm. So coming back to the question, is the concept of Akhanda Bharat possible? It's a hundred percent possible if you want to take the route and say, "Let's capture all the land." It's possible. Then you require a different strategy for it. But as a teacher, my own thing about Akhanda Bharat is that maybe seven, eight billion people across the world can they at least understand and respect Indian Vedic culture? Mm. Please understand, Vedic culture is global culture. It teaches you about healthy life. it teaches about spirituality it is not about just one community one religion one tradition i believe if everybody in the world sits and meditates he is a part of akhand bharat okay so last question is from a teammate sanjit keswani he is asked according to you because you've worked with politicians who is a good politician according to you do you want to name anyone or like do you want to please understand in our great indian culture okay it is the qualities that makes a person So every person has got plus and minuses. Nobody is picture perfect. So let me tell you three qualities that makes a great politician. Okay, first things first. Praja sukhe sukham rak. Yeah, praja naam cha gite gitam. Chana kaise is this? Jo politician, jo leader, apne praja ke liye kam karta hai, wohi acha raja ban sakta hai. First quality, thinking about the people first, not your welfare, but the people's welfare. Second, a good politician is the one who abides to the quality of vridha sanyoga he takes advice from somebody else wiser people politicians are in power and if they don't listen to others they become dictators mm. so in our great culture every great leader had a guru for chandragupta we had chanakya a good politician should take guidance from the wise and the third and the most important thing is tyag the ability to give up a problem with both politicians right you now they want to grow from power to power in our podcast also you know a corporator wants to become an mla mla wants to become an mp and then cm and pm no when i going to stop mm. so the day you become a politician please plan your exit also mm. not run away fulfill your duties and our great culture says the leader is the one who creates more leaders mm. leader is not the one who creates more followers So, who are as these three qualities is an ideal politician, an ideal leader for me. Mm. But what is the realistic picture looking like over the next five years, according to you, from a cultural perspective? Because we have to address this when we're talking about yeah. politics. Uh, it's an advantage and it's a danger also. Okay, advantage why? Because India is talking about the ancient culture that we have to reunite ourselves. So, you know, everything is getting Indianized, Indianized, Indianized. So, education system maybe अपने heroes को लेके आ रहे. Not about the foreigners who invaded us. So the advantage is that India is waking up to Indianness, but unfortunately, we cannot define India as only a part of one particular community. So I'll tell you, I've been doing a lot of uh, study myself. When we talk about India being invaded, okay, 
you'll be surprised all the things that came from the you know maybe alexander era till the british and the moguls and the portuguese and all you'll be surprised they're only in the uh, sorry top for part of india okay as in so if you look at the up bihar and delhi and all those things just go below you'll be surprised the same time when the invasions were happening down over there we were expanding globally vikramaditya the chola empires in martanda varma in kerala okay same time the invasions happening in the north india is not only north or south india is a combination so we were actually sending traders and we built temples huge temples in cambodia you're saying the geographical south of the country was doing very well when the north absolutely, was getting invaded absolutely absolutely the history we are being taught is only about invasions it is one part of it but the thing is that down south below the trade was happening singapore Mm. If you go to China, you go to Malaysia. All those where Indians were expanding in the same era, but we only talk about it partly and say, "Look, okay, your biceps are growing, but what's going to happen to your tummy and your legs?" Mm. So it's very important to look at it holistically. So I think what's important is that India doesn't think only the way we're taught in textbooks. You spoke about going to UP and Bihar and talking about. Let me tell you, go down to South in Kerala, you'll be surprised. There are actually people who's okay. For example, I'll give you an example of Kerala. Let's say for that matter, yes. there are different religions in kerala also but they have some common festivals the two festivals from kerala okay vishu and onam are not religious festivals do you know this so there they come to they have their opinions there have their debates and whatever every state now that's happening but what's very important our great rishi said in spite of the difference what is the commonality okay so yes there were problems in india but i think we cannot look at the youth being radicalized but i believe the youth should be logicalized So radicalization is mine, mine, not versus you. No, this country is a flavor of so many things. So today, a Parsi or a Jew is also an equal in Indian. You cannot say you know, a Parsi came from abroad and now. No, they are the greatest contributor to this particular country. The the leftover Jews are doing so much for this particular country also. So I think it's not just Hindu, Muslims, or Christians, or Jews, or Parsis, or Sikh. But the thing is that that's where our debates have to go on. Our problem is that we have diverted also so much into fragments. it can be a up versus another state or this state was no it cannot be and i want to just end up this on a new year note and a very important thing let us not forget one of the things can that can destroy this country we are not even talking about this openly it's called drugs we don't take it as seriously on any of the discussions let me tell you a story and wind up over there bihar was the intellectual capital of our country at one point of time chanakya came from there do you know how bihar got destroyed not many people know about it not many people know about it and i want to bring it i want each person watching this to actually read and find out it is not a old story just happened around 100 years ago till that bihar was a very great place darbanga is a place where some of the best rajas came from what happened in the last 300 years sorry 100 years not many people know there was an opium trade that was started between india and china by the britishers they put up two factories in bihar and one generation the whole thing got into drugs the opium and the whole intellectual tradition got destroyed bihar okay and we're talking about talking about what westernization is drugs can destroy a complete culture a complete youth and a complete it took mahatma gandhi to go and ban opium are you aware of this so when we're talking about all these cultural things education what's the your kind of habits that you get at one end we are talking about meditation the other end we are talking about new year celebrations in the pub i'm not against pub okay please understand this but the point over here is that do you know the menace that can happen with the drug economy that's happening around today you are talking about the economy of you know uh, bsc bombay stock exchange and national stock exchange but there is a dirty economy that happens right below our belly we're not even aware we don't talk about this openly i want the youth to be aware of it every college principal that i speak every college principal by the way being in mumbai university i have direct access to 850 college principals not one or two everybody is worried about the youth getting into drug it's primarily cannabis right like marijuana I, no different forms okay. but what i'm saying that vices can destroy complete knowledge tradition vices that happened bihar was where jainism buddhism all the philosophies of chanakya came out and we were rich in tradition So my request over here is that as we are discussing about religion, let's also discuss something that can destroy this particular country, yeah. the dirty economy that we are talking about. I think you are highlighting addiction, addiction of different forms. I would even put junk food in that same category, honestly. Uh, 
जंक फूड इज समथिंग दैट कैन डिस्ट्रॉय टू सम एक्सटेंट बट ड्रग्स कैन डिस्ट्रॉय कंप्लीट सिविलाइजेशन to different level yeah i think so, at, at its core the leadership of the country as in the future leaders which i believe strongly are listeners of this podcast yeah. need to be in a self improvement mentality and that just holding on to that spirituality is only solution for that yeah spirituality is one of the last stages of self improvement i feel it can be an early stage if you wish but for a lot of people i think they'll go through physical Again, fitness I, i disagree over here because according to our great indian culture spirituality if not introduced in the beginning you cannot get it in the end of your life okay so it's like you know pura zindagi bhar bhog kiya abhi aakhri 65 years mein yoga karega ho hi nahi sakta yeah it has to be introduced in the beginning only i completely agree with you sir the issue is people reject it people my age rejected early on and it takes no you not rejected you never got introduced yeah maybe introduced in the right way and in a nice positive way mm. see spirituality is a solution for every problem in the world because it makes you internally strong mm. our problem is that 99% of the people believe spirituality is post retirement activity see mm. my father is a yogi i mean the way he he introduced me to spirituality today look at it i'm by the way other uh, uh, other kind of an impression people have is that those who are spiritual are not worldly successful mm. <laughs> okay so please understand that spirituality makes you worldly successful also so all are great rajas were actually spiritual krishna was a raja mahavir buddha they were all kings so if you want to be a king and a truly a great and ideal king you better get into spirituality early the better mm-hmm. meditation rituals practices traditions all are important but coming back to the point is that we need to save a generation by introducing them into the right role models and spiritual leaders yeah. as early as possible I I think I think we are getting there gradually. We are getting there. At least I can see the leadership at the top in corporates, in startups, in all sorts of organizations having some sort of spiritual inclination. Yes. You know, be it even the army. I've spoken to so many people from the armed forces who have this sort But of. But why don't we talk about it mainstream? It's getting there, sir. Gradually. Okay. Let me put it this way: Are we guilty about this? Honestly, the reason a lot of people don't talk about it now is even spirituality is bracketed as extremely right wing. So even when we talk about spirituality on this show, we are, you and me are bracketed as hyper right wing. Therefore, automatically so. anti minority. No way. My best students in Mumbai universities have been from Muslims and Christians. Yeah. I can even tell you that the problem is the way we introduce it. Hmm. I have never introduced Chanakya from a religious perspective. For me, Chanakya was a strategist. and any particular person can be a strategist it doesn't matter male or female or an old or a young or a religion or a no well, it doesn't matter so the problem is how we put it yeah okay uh i'd probably like to end this particular <laughs> sorry, episode sorry, no okay. no by just highlighting this whole religion aspect yeah. again see i feel at the end of the day it's not just the leadership at the top or the decisions at the top which govern a country it's also the mentality of the people it's what the people feel for each other yes. and you highlighted the south of india as a very yes. strong part yes. of india that yes. stayed powerful even through the invasions it was because people of all different religions were united correct they had one single identity correct so as long as we all learn to live in peace with each other and kind of i believe have a sports mentality throughout the country yes. you, for every virat kohli you need a mohammad shami see this country is a great balance yeah see you cannot remove a community and say that you know okay we are going to be only this religion it can't happen yeah. in fact the beauty of this particular culture is that add on add on or naya aayega to usko bhi le lo yeah. you're right so virat kohli requires a balancer also yeah and uh, if you do feel hate towards a particular religion or a particular person from a religion because they are part of a religion understand that that hate is first going to harm you and then it will go and harm what you are trying to harm so get rid of the hate from your heart that's probably the message we need but, to put out but 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 get rid of the hate but please debate hmm a problem is that okay i know this but i'm trying to openly speak about it we need to have lots of debates in this country yeah and it has to be public debates not just you know television debates yeah. because television debate doesn't end up with anything logical and even understand a lot of the social media accounts you follow it could be individual journalists it could be um different journalism portals a lot of people have agendas or a lot of people have a very strong sense of fear that they have built because of their own echo chambers and you are absorbing bits of that fear into your own head and i am proud to be a, from my religion from my country from my culture so other person also has the right yeah. but together we can learn and grow better yeah so i think it's very important that you know this whole generation coming back to the new year agenda 
it's looking at you know let's look at the other perspective it's oh, not about right or wrong and maybe it's the gen z and gen alphas you know the ones who were born after the year 2000 yes hopefully that entire generation is deeply united okay. and kind of takes india into like a and i'm very proud to be an indian yeah 100% sir 100% jai hind jai hind. lovely let's end this podcast yeah. Radha sir thank oh. you <laughs> hey, sorry i last me to thoda main alag chala gaya no no it's all good it's all good people need to hear conversations like this thank you for listening everybody lots of love so folks that was the episode for today please tell me what you thought of it of course we're going to go much deeper into this whole current affairs tangent I want to know what you guys thought of this particular episode. Write in on social media, tell us in the comment section. Of course we're going to be covering all the hot topics that happen in India and in the world generally. We're going to be talking to intellectuals like Dr. Radha, people from the Indian military like GD Bakshi or Captain Raghu Raman. We're going to be talking to IPS officers like D Shivanandan sir. So we've got access to these minds and now it's your turn to help us build this podcast. follow us on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world please tell us what other topics you'd like us to cover on the runbeer show we want to build the podcast we want to evolve it as time goes by 2022 is a new beginning for us you're going to see a very different trs presented to you thanks for supporting always looking for your feedback